This episode is brought to you by Pepsi Wild Cherry. Pepsi Wild Cherry is bursting with delicious cherry flavor and a sweet, crisp taste that gives you more to go wild for. Getting wild may look different these days, but whether it's opting for a solo Friday binge watch or a big night out, everyone can indulge in their wild side with Pepsi Wild Cherry, also available in Zero Sugar. So grab a Pepsi Wild Cherry and get wild. Duke fans, welcome to episode 601 of the DBR podcast, the Duke Basketball Roundup. It is, uh, I'd say it's roughly an hour, hour and a half after uh, Duke got finished with business against Louisville today, uh, this evening I should say. I am Jason Evans. I am joined by Donald Wine. Donald, how you doing, my friend? I'm doing well. I was uh, hosting a pre-reunion event for my class, the class of 2004. Obviously, we are coming up on our 20-year reunion this april uh so we had some people out at the watch party bar here in dc to to you know gather and watch the game shout out to the greatest class in duke history the class 2004 jason will disagree with me there but jason is, yeah. has every right to be wrong just like everybody else out there who is not a part of the greatest class the class 2004 shout out to y'all uh yeah i'm class of, of 89 you know we're on the same five-year cycle yeah so you guys are you guys are coming up on 20 I'm coming up on, I guess, 35. 35. God damn, I'm old. Ugh. Ugh. Registration begins next week, Jason. I think it's this, or maybe it might be this week. So, yeah, I don't know. I'm, I'm not <laughs> sure I'm going to make it. <laughs> I got stuff going on. Reminding hey, myself. If we win the national I... championship, it's that week. So you got to come. Like, that's just, you got to come. I'm going to hold you to that. We'll see. We'll see. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We are here with purpose. Uh, you know, we, we called this a regular episode. It may be a bites. It may be kind of quick. Uh, I, I don't, you know, there isn't a ton to say about this game against Louisville. The Blue Devils win this contest 84 to 59. Uh, I'll be honest. It wasn't really all that competitive. I mean, like, I, like last time we played Louisville, it was still, you know, it was still a little bit competitive for a while into the second half. You know, first two minutes of the second half, this game was pretty much all, all finished. I'll start with some headlines. We haven't gotten a lot of headlines. The inbox not blowing up yet. I think, honestly, I think everyone was a little uninspired by this game. Donald, I think you had a, a, a great point in the preview that we did a couple of days ago when you said, you know, Louisville makes you sort of play down to them. It's sort of, it's sloppy. It's messy. There's not, mm -hmm. frankly, there's not a lot of effort out there. It, it's a very weird kind of contest. And I think that infected Duke to some extent. I mean, you know, look, we won by 25 the entire second half. I don't think the lead ever got below about 13 or something like that. It never, even for a moment, felt like Duke was in any trouble in this game. Louisville's just awful. But but the bottom line is, you know, as I'm dealing with the headlines, there just aren't a ton of headlines to for us to, to read. But I got some good ones. William Kberg. William. Woo! I love this. Duke deodorizes P.U.ville. <laughs> PU Evil. PU yeah. PU Evil, yes. Uh Louisville stinks. PU. Uh Jared Strauss. Uh we always love alliteration. Jared gave me Roach, Rose, Redbirds. Say that five times fast. Jer uh, Jeremy Roach, I think, was one of the major stories of this contest. And then John Grantland. John. Oh my God. This was amazing. Call back to episode 600 and the great story by Kenny Denard about the Red Sparrows. If you have not heard that story on episode 600, do yourself a favor, go back and listen to it. John Grantland said, flip the cards and send in the Red Sparrows. That was great. <laughs> that was great. Oh, that's amazing. Amazing headline. Also, shout John. out to Jared, because Jared, Jared's one of the people, and we have people who do this, but Jared Strauss is one of those guys that sends in uh, you know, a few uh options yes. for us to use and so uh, you you mentioned one that i like but there was another one that i thought was cool the calm after the storm i think I, that that one played played like well that into well. this game as well yeah uh and and by the way let's let's start with you know the the elephant so to speak in the room which was that kyle filipowski was fine and he it, you know he had no trouble at all playing in this contest didn't really look like he was bothered by by the knee that got banged up in the court storming incident. 
Um, on the other hand, Caleb Foster, uh, it's one thing when they say you're day to day, when they say you're week to week, it's a bad sign. I'm just hoping we get Caleb back in time for maybe the Carolina game or the ACC tournament. But it seems like Caleb Foster has something pretty serious going on with him and will not be available this weekend for the game against Virginia. Don, let's get let's start with the good. Uh, host privilege going first. I'm going to talk about the defense. Yeah, do. Now, uh, look, uh, Louisville's awful. Let's just be clear about that. They take a ton of tough shots. And that's not a good way. <laughs> that's not a good way to to be an efficient scoring team taking bad shots with guys' hands in your face. But Duke stayed in front. We made it hard for them to get good looks. Um, I can't even count how many times Louisville had to shoot the ball with like less than three seconds left in the shot clock. It was, it, it, and there was some. There was one possession I recall where I think Louisville had like four air balls. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like they could not get that shot clock to reset, and then like. Flip got, grabbed the rebound for a second, and it got knocked out of his hands out of bounds, and so Louisville retained possession, and and they still kept on shooting air balls. It was crazy. Um, I've never seen. I don't think I've. I, I don't. There are no point guards in the ACC who dribble as much as Sky Clark and Tyler Johnson do. I mean, those guys just pounding the ball, going no- nowhere. But again, Duke's defense was harassing. We forced them to shoot. There were one for their first fourteen on three pointers. We only gave up fifty nine points. I thought this was a, a nice defensive effort by Duke, and part of defense is getting on the re- uh, getting you know getting rebounds. Duke wins the rebounding battle. We've talked about Donald how how important Duke winning the rebounding battle is to this team. Forty three to twenty four. That is yeah, a that that was that, fun. That's a big old number. Forty three to twenty four, and included in that was Duke pulling down thirteen offensive rebounds, almost forty five percent of our missed shots. We offensive rebounded. Jason, I think when you talk about, again, when you talk about a team that's bad, it's one thing for a team to be bad, but you also want them to play bad. You want to force their hand into playing the way that they have been playing. And the defense did that tonight, right? But holding Louisville to 41% from the floor, 18% from three. They even went 10 for 19 from the line. And we'll talk about the line for Duke as well, I'm sure, a little bit later. But I think when when it comes to playing Louisville, it, it doesn't matter how bad they are if they play well against you and you have to, you still have to play your defense. You still have to have your scheme. And they were, you know, there's a couple of guys that got their points, but what Duke was great at doing is frustrating Louisville into making bad decisions with the basketball. And in that, as you mentioned, that includes shooting bad shots. So it, again, it don't mean a thing. If it ain't got that swing, that's the saying, right? But on defense, it doesn't. It, you can have you can have a terrible shooting team all you want, but if they shoot the ball well, they're no longer a terrible shooting team. You have to make them shoot poorly, and Duke was able to make Louisville shoot poorly all night long. Yeah, exactly. And, and look, we've talked about the fact that this Duke team, one of the keys to their success is is you know playing better defense, getting their defensive metrics, their defensive efficiency up there. And, and I thought this was a, a nice effort, albeit against a team. That is really, really bad in Louisville. Uh, before we get to the players, because we're going to have plenty of players that we need to talk about in the good, I, I want to talk about the shot chart very briefly. Uh, in this guy, you, you guys know I hate the mid range jumper. It's not an efficient part of any offensive game. Duke only took three mid range jumpers in this contest, uh, two of them by Jeremy Roach, including one that was like a step back. I think that like he took off and he was just barely outside the lane. He landed further back, and maybe that's where the shot. Uh, you know, where the shot was sort of registered from. But it looked to me like, for the most part, other than a couple by Roach, there was one by McCain where he sort of pump faked a three-pointer and then stepped in and took about an 18-footer. The, the Duke did nothing but take shots in the lane and beyond the three-point line. And I mm-hmm. haven't talked a lot about that in recent weeks, but it is such an important part of being an efficient, good offensive team like Duke is. It's worth noting, by the way, those three mid-range shots that I talked about, two by Roach, one by McCain, we missed all three of them. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it feels like every time I look at the shot chart, I'm like, oh, look at the shots outside the lane and inside the three point line. We've missed every one of them. It's crazy. And they weren't bad misses. They were like, you know, the ones no, that fine, like kind of go know? halfway down and it come out. Yeah. It, they're, they're the ones that are like, oh, they should have gone in. They probably went three quarters of the way down, but they just didn't go yeah. in. They're, they're not, they're not bad shots, but still, I just love to point out the fact that mid range shots, not very efficient unless you're like Kevin Durant and folks, Steph Curry, folks like that. Uh, by the way, it is worth noting. 
Louisville took 13 mid-range shots in this game, 13 shots outside the lane, but inside the three-point line, they hit four of them, four of 13. If you want to know why Louisville is a bad team, if you want to know why Louisville is bad on offense, it's because they take bad shots. Those are bad shots. Duke did not fall into that trap. When the Duke guys got around their man, they didn't pull up and shoot from 18. They went to the hole again and again and again. Duke, had, The shot chart for this game is beautiful. It's just a ton of shots like hovering around uh, the basket and then a shot and then shots all beyond the three point line. And, and that's why we're one of the most efficient offensive teams in the country is because we do that night in and night out. Jason, I think when you look at some of the general stat categories, you look at all of them. I, I think there might be one forward facing positive stat that Louisville beat Duke in. And as they made one more free throw than we did, everything else skews Duke. Duke, eight steals, 23 assists on 32 field goals, 72%. Points in the paint, outscored them 42 to 30. Second chance points, 12 to 9 Duke. Fast break points, 18 to 8 Duke. The bench points, 17 to 13 Duke. Points off turnovers, it was the closest stat there, 13 to 12 Duke. And when you look again at the field goal percentages, we blow them out of the water in every single one of those categories. The rebounds were there, as you mentioned. It, it's steals again we had you know more steals that we only forced nine turnovers but eight of them were steals so that means that they're exciting turnovers they were they were guys getting active in passing <laughs> lanes so i'm cool it wasn't just you know louisville throwing the ball into to the upper you know upper stands uh the upstairs seats over there at cameron it was us forcing the issue and getting the ball so that's what makes this and I, online i, I want to push back before we get to the individual players i want to push back a little bit on some of the things we saw online and, and i know we got a couple of emails about how People thought we really looked terrible in this game. And, and again, I mentioned you, you have to play terrible against Louisville sometimes to beat them. But also when you blink, like we were, I think we were up like eight or nine. And then I blinked and we were up 25. That's how quickly we were able to really get out. Like Jeremy Roach and guys were able to hit threes in succession. And you can't do that without being efficient, as you mentioned, and also playing defense. And, and so I think that this game, Yes, we played a terrible team, and at times we looked terrible with them. But that's sometimes how you beat terrible teams. Is you have to kind of, you know, you know, play in the mud a little bit to to get what you need. But at the end of the day, this was a very methodical clinical win. Like you, you can't look at a, a score and says eighty four to fifty nine and go, this team didn't play great. This team played excellent, and the stats show that in al almost every single statistical category, Duke beat Louisville. And if you do that. Like it, you can't ask for more. Like you really can't. It's very hard to ask for more from this team. We're going to because we want everything to be perfect, right? We want everything to be there. Yes. There's there's many details that we can always work on. But if you look at this game, this was a very good game for Duke. They came, they took care of the business that they were supposed to, and they got the win. All right, let's start with the individual players who deserve being mentioned in the good. And, and I think it has to begin with the Ken Palm MVP of this game, Jeremy Roach. He hits five out of seven two-pointers. He hits three out of four three-pointers. He had six rebounds. He had three steals, 19 points. I, I mean, smooth. Just everything about his play looked incredibly smooth in this game. He had the possessions with back-to-back -back three pointers that really broke the game open for Duke. Mm -hmm. uh, he had a few just incredibly sweet finishes in the lane. Just stuff that beautiful, beautiful. He has such great body control. Gets his shoulders square. He he has that ability to sort of hang in the air a little bit and you know figure out the exact angle he needs, which you know uh, to to take the shot. Sometimes right handed, sometimes left handed. Um, he looked at times like he could really score at will. You know, I, I actually think one of the one of the unfortunate things in this game is that like his usage percentage was only fourteen percent. Like Kyle Filipowski and Mark Mitchell, um, you know, were guys who were like sort of taking a lot more shots when they were in the game. Than, than Jeremy Roach was. I, I kind of wish Jeremy Roach would have almost taken more shots because he was just, I, I, I thought it was an outstanding, outstanding co uh, contest from him. One of his better games. And man, it is a pleasure to have that kind of a guy as a senior leading your squad. A anytime, you know, anytime you feel like Duke needs a basket, I'm sorry, there's no one I want the ball in his hand more than Jeremy Roach. Yeah, he's the, he, has the, he has the clutch gene that we, we said we've been, missing a lot of times this year and a lot of those times it was because he was hurt and was not in the game 
he he has that when you say that he's in in the lane it looks it, the word that i use to describe it is poetic like you go up in the air and you're just like wow that looks good he looks good the ball's going in everything about this play is perfect like he has those moments i like he's poetic in the lane. man i like that poetic that's is a just a way great to, way to describe yeah. it but also jason you kind of glossed over this fact he had six rebounds this man does not go into the lane and get rebounds but he had six tonight so that tells you that even that part of his game he's trying to continually improve add you know add everything else to the to the mix but you know him going in and getting six rebounds is just that's ridiculous because usually he's he's still getting his points he's maybe getting a few more assists but he's getting his steals and and usually it's just like maybe one rebound right he's not asked to do that but tonight he decided that he needs to go in there and, and establish that part of his game as well and was taking on everybody and getting some of those boards so up next for me in the players, I'm going to get to a couple guys off the bench. TJ Power got yep. his most run since the Queens game on December 30th. He plays almost 15 minutes in this contest. When he hit the three-pointer, after Kyle Filipowski found him on the perimeter, and TJ Power drained a three-pointer. And to me, the big moment there was as they came back down the floor to play defense, you saw Flip really in TJ's ear, talking to him, encouraging him. You just saw, you know, a lot of a lot of love, a lot of teammate kind of stuff happening there and uh you know really flip really encouraging um tj and 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 i i hope 15 minutes is a lot for him and he played early i i hope it's a sign of you know maybe we're going to get a little more out of him but the guy you really got to talk about off the bench sean stewart all right sean plays 11 minutes 11 minutes nine points and nine rebounds four offensive rebounds and look i want to be clear about something Sean has butterfingers. I mean, that's just, that's just the honest to God truth. There, he probably should have had a couple more rebounds. He probably should have had at least four more points if he could hold on to the ball. He has a little trouble holding on to the ball. Like the, the behind the back pass, the Kyle Filipowski made to him. Flip goes to the lane, throws a behind the back pass. Um, uh, uh, John King, JK on the DVR boards, one of the great people involved with uh, the, the Duke, the DBR, not this DBR, but the other DBR. JK sent me an email and he goes, Flips behind the back pass would have been epic if anyone in the arena had been expecting it, including uh, <laughs> including Sean Stewart. <laughs> yeah. But the reason I bring all this up is even with the Butterfingers, whatever the hell you want to call it, Sean pops. He pops off the screen. I said it on our preview podcast for this, and I'll say it again. I think John Shire needs to find a way to give Sean Stewart more minutes. Again, 11 minutes, nine points, and nine rebounds. Even with sometimes glaring mistakes, he is a rare talent. He changes the geometry of the game with his athleticism. Please, can we find a way to get minutes for Sean Stewart in every game, in every half? There needs to be a two or three or four minute run, at least one of them for Sean Stewart in every single half. I know Mark Mitchell's been playing great basketball, and it, you can't really play those two guys together, um, you know, or at least it's difficult to. But God, I'm just seeing things from this kid that I'm like, that like, I know he is going to, he pops. There's no other word for it than that. He, you know, a couple of weeks ago when we were talking about him, we said that the game has not quite slowed down for him yet. And it still hasn't, ha it still hasn't, it still happened, hasn't, but it's starting to, right. You see the, you see the game getting a bit slower for him every single time he runs up and down the court. And as you mentioned, you mentioned nine points. He was three for three from the field. Like he, he, you know, yeah, he may have probably probably could have had 15 if he had caught a couple of those, but he he made everything that he shot, which is great. He had two assists, which again is not part of his game, but he, you know, I think a couple of them were off of I think the two were off of a uh, offensive rebounds that he got and he kicked back out to somebody for for a jumper, which is great. He's finding guys. That part of his game is slowing down for him. I will mention also with TJ Power. Uh, first of all, a uh, shout out to my friend E. Uh, she asked the question that maybe needs answering from our listeners. What does TJ stand for? Is it just TJ? Because he's not listed as an acronym. And she was trying to figure out for the life of her what what oh, the wow. government TJ name is. Uh, and if it is just TJ. Uh, so DBR podcast at gmail.com. If you do have that answer or if you can find it for us, uh, we will shout you out for that. Because that one I that one was a toughie. But also the fact that he looks like Timothy Chalamet's stunt double in Dune 2. The, the, but the fact is he plays... He has a, he has the game come to him in a way that maybe is a little uh, it hasn't slowed down as much for him as it has recently for Sean Stewart. But this is the game that you bring him in for. This is the game that you 
build his confidence. And I thought he was very confident in his time on the, on the court. This is what you use to prepare this entire team for March, because there was going to be a point that you were going to need to put in a Sean Stewart. You're going to need to put in a TJ power. You're going to need to put in Ryan young for extended minutes. And so for them to get as much run as they did tonight, it shows that John Shire trusts them, that he's confident in them, and that he wants them to be confident in themselves and everybody else on the team to feel confident when they come on the floor. That's what this game was about. So when I, when people say this game was kind of a, a, a slow burn and that we didn't look good, this is what you need to see. You need to see those guys come in and play. So I, I, I'm really happy that they got, got a lot of burn. The final thing about the bench, Jason, I'll mention in the good, Spencer Hubbard. With My the man. Chef Curry three pointer, <laughs> saw it, he said, "Chef Curry, Steph, that's great. You shoot forty footers. I do too. That was that was awesome. But it on but the also, move. on the move. Like it was it was terrific because you want to see those guys do well. The, the guys that do all the practice and 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 are comp and, and fully confident with staying at the end of the bench and, and cheering on their teammates. It was great to have a moment for him where the entire gym was cheering for him. That was awesome. Shout out Spencer Hubbard." Yeah, and by the way, we had more than a few. I think we got more emails saying Spencer Hubbard's three is the play of the game than we did actual headline emails. <laughs> right, yeah. The, the the inbox, the DBR podcast at gmail.com inbox was blowing up, baby, with people who were like, Spencer Hubbard, play of the game. Uh, I love that. Uh, real hey, quick, real quick, Jason. Yeah. Uh, you know, yeah. We were mentioning guys that, you know, if, if I, I feel kind of bad saying this. We haven't mentioned Jeremy Kane's name that much yet. But four for seven from three, 14 points, four rebounds, three assists, one steal. He he had such a complete game that we almost didn't notice it. Like that's like that's how good this man has become. He's starting every game. He's playing the way that he's you know been playing. He's no longer a fresh he passed past freshman year a long time ago. But for him to you know do four out of seven from three and us not even mention it shows how good he's become in a way. Yeah. And by the way, uh this was a game where Duke was eleven of twenty-two. Um, on on our three pointers, fifty percent. I'll, I'll take fifty percent hitting eleven yep. three pointers any day of the week. Uh, other guys we have not mentioned who probably deserve a mention: Mark Mitchell. Uh, it's got seventeen points in this game on on six of nine two points two pointers. Uh, he hit a three. He, by the way, had three steals. And I want to mention just really quickly Tyrese Proctor, who look you know everybody in Duke was shooting pretty good from the perimeter except for Tyrese, just one of five on three pointers. Tyrese had seven assists in this game. And that's the most he's had since Southern Indiana back in back in November. And he only had one turnover, by the way. And Tyrese had a couple really nice connections with Sean Stewart, you know, for lobs to, to get Sean going in the first half. They're, they have great chemistry, those two guys. Uh, look, we're going to be missing Caleb Foster. Uh, it means that Tyrese Proctor's back in the starting lineup, which is probably where he belongs. Uh, but I think uh, it, really good for him and his confidence to have one of his better games – passing the ball, controlling the, the game, controlling the offense in the first game where we're missing Caleb Foster. And by the way, I know I mentioned him early on, Jeremy Roach, but I do want to shout out that Jeremy Roach played backup point guard in this game. He hasn't had to do that very much at all this year. No trouble, no problem at all with him doing that. And finally, Jason, my last part of the good, we mentioned Kyle Filipowski. In fact, you know, he's, he seems to be okay uh, after, after what happened at Wake Forest. He starts the game. He has a 10-5-5 game, but it's not with points. Uh, he has nine points, so he's not going to count in our stat game, but he was very, very close. Nine yeah. points, 10 rebounds, six assists, one block. And Jason, this stat right here, I, I, it has been a long time since I have seen somebody with a plus 31. That is yeah, that's a big number. <laughs> that's a big, that. that's number. a big number. Yeah. There, there, there are a lot of pretty good numbers here for, for Duke players, you know, on, on, on the plus minus line. I mean, look, you know, in the game you win this big, you're going to have a lot of big number. 31 is a very impressive number for, for flip my man there. All right. We're going to take a break on the other side. We got, got to do a couple things in the bad, got to do the play of the game. Uh, and in the bad, you're going to hear the words free throws and turnovers. Those will be mentioned <laughs> that story coming up. Hey everyone, Jason and Donald here from the Duke Basketball Roundup. And as the NFL season comes to an end, the college hoops and NBA seasons are heating up at my bookie. Turn your basketball knowledge and skill 
and to wins at my bookie where every shot, every spin, and every bet opens the door to a payday. Hey, whether you're backing your favorite team, I wonder who that could be, Duke, or seeking the thrill of a casino win, my bookie provides a world class betting experience. You can get a 50% bonus on your first deposit at mybookie.ag with the promo code DUKEMBB. Duke MBB. And you will be able to experience the thrill of backing your favorite team, hundreds of player props, and the allure of my bookie's casino. Even easier, you can use the link in the show notes here from this episode. It'll take you directly there. That's right, Jason. And from the latest slots to classic table games, my bookie offers a one stop shop from the court to the casino. It has it all. So follow the link in the show notes or again, use promo code Duke MBB to cash out and win or let it ride at my bookie. Bet and play absolutely anything, anytime, anywhere, only with my bookie. Back from the break, and like I teased, we're going to be talking a little about turnovers. Duke had 10 turnovers in the first half. It felt like we got stripped of the ball or just fumbled the ball away a lot in the first half. Now, look, I, I know the Blue Devils had, I think it was a 13-point lead at halftime, I want to say. Uh, could have been 20. Could have been 20-plus tw- if we took care of the ball at all. We cleaned it up. I mean, the nice thing about it is I'm sitting here talking about it in the bad because 10 turnovers in the first half is really bad. But we cleaned it up pretty nicely in the second half. I think that we only had like one or two turnovers in the first about 14 or 15 minutes of the second half. There are a couple, couple of them came late, you know, when sort of, uh, you know, everyone's sort of playing out the string a little bit. But uh, but for the game, um, you know, I, I like the fact that Duke got better on the turnover problem. But man, that first half at times, that was that was some ugly stuff, wasn't it, Donald? Yeah, and and. I think that's where probably a lot of our emails came in. I know we got a lot of early emails, first half, early second half, about how sloppy it looked like we were playing. And I agree. Like, again, sometimes you have to dumb yourself down to play a game against a team like Louisville. But this is the part that you you could have left at home. You didn't have to bring the turnovers to to Cameron. And that's where, again, (laughs) little details. There's just little details that we just need to clean up. This is, again, a very good game. But 14 turnovers and 10 of them in the first half. I, again, I thought we did much better in the second half, but it felt like early on in an effort to try and blow them out of the water early, we were very sloppy in doing that. We we shot 54% from the floor in the first half. I think we were, what, seven or uh, four for eight from three in the first half. So we we did those numbers just fine. And if we had more possessions because it, that ended in a shot, chances are we would have had more points and, and would have been, you know, would have had a 20 point lead at halftime and not, not look back. So these are the little details that you clean up and, and hope that you get better as the season goes along, because this is what you, you can't, you, you can't turn the ball over 14 times. No one's asking for 14 turnovers in an effort to win the game. Keep it under 10, which is what we've been doing for the most part this year. You know, the crazy thing about the turnovers, by the way, Jeremy Roach had one, Tyrese Proctor had one. Those are the two guys who are handling the ball for the most part. And then, like McCain had three, Flip and Mitchell each had four. Mm-hmm. Now I know you know we were we were moving the game through Flip a lot. You, you pointed out he had six assists, you know, a big number for him on assists. Uh, so I, I guess the four turnovers are a little more excusable in that regard. But but yeah, it was kind of strange to see the guys who were turning the ball over um, a pretty fair bit in this contest. Uh, look, Donald, we got to talk about the free throws. Yep. Uh, you want to take the lead on this one because ugh, ugly. Fifty. You mean, I mean. 56%, 9 for 16 from the line. Again, it doesn't hurt you when you're playing Louisville and you're up by 25, but it will hurt you if you're missing, you know, almost half of your free throws in a big game. We have to make our free throws. And yes, yeah, sure, this is the one stat that is almost uh, unfair, right? Everyone wants to hit, wants you to hit 100% of your free throws. No one ever does. Like very rarely do people hit 100% of free throws, but you want it to be in the 80% range. You want it to be 75% to 80% because those are free points. Nobody is guarding you. Nobody is in front of you and you're at home. So nobody's actively razzing you in the stands. Everyone is on your side here. So you, you want to make those and knock those down. Now, Louisville didn't do any, do much do any better like from the line so it was just an ugly affair for both teams but when you have free opportunities to make take points take them make concentrate if you have to take an extra second to to make the free throw 
go ahead and do it. We have all the time in the world. Well, I guess we have 10 seconds, but we have all the time in the world when <laughs> when free throw when free throws are, are being talked about. That's that's got to that's got to change. We haven't been good at free throws lately. That that's the one thing that really needs to change. Yeah, and your point about lately really rings true. In in uh, non-conference games, Duke is above 75% on free throws. In conference games, Duke is right at 70%, well, almost 71. Uh Duke is 12th in the ACC in in free throw shooting and uh look, you you know, this is going to come back and bite I'm afraid this is going to come back and bite us in some game. We'll be in a tight game and you know, we'll have the wrong guy at the line because there are a couple guys in this team. There's several guys in this team that, you know, really knock down those free throws. But then there's some guys who really, really struggle. You know, you, you put Jeremy Roach or Jared McCain on the line. I'm feeling pretty good about things. Um, but Mark Mitchell and Kyle Filipowski, I'm a little bit like, eh, you know, I get a little bit nervous. And they so. can knock him down, too. Like, it, you know, these are guys that have yeah. a stroke. It's not like they have a terrible stroke uh, at the free throw line. You know, they may have terrible shots elsewhere on the floor but they, at the free throw line they're pretty good it's just about again taking that maybe that taking the extra half second to compose yourself to take that extra breath to kind of calm your heart rate and make it where it's not you're not forcing uh a quick free uh free throw or getting outside of your mechanics it, it's again little things and it's, it's not something they aren't working on anybody knows any, anybody who has played basketball knows you shoot free throws in practice every single day you shoot free throws at every shoot around it's the one thing that is a constant. So this is something that clearly they're working on. They just need to carry that over into the game when it's time to concentrate. All right. So my last thing I have in the bad, there's not a lot of bad in this game, but I, I did want to mention that it, it just, it wasn't a very aesthetically pleasing game. <laughs> it was a bit of a herky jerky sort of strange game. And I, I don't want to say that Duke wasn't intense. Look, there were, there were a couple of times that there were balls on the floor. I saw guys getting after it, but you know, it, it, it just, it was hard to play well with an opponent that sucks this bad. And, and, and it was not a, you know, I, I just didn't feel quite as much intensity or urgency as I would like to. Uh, again, I think that's probably the fault of, of playing an opponent who's, who just doesn't have it in them. But like there was, there was a weird play that I just wanted to point out. And it's not, I don't even know if it goes in the good or the bad, but with about three minutes left, Sky Clark went to the baseline and lost the ball as he was falling out of bounds. And the ball just like bounced there like three or four times. I think people thought maybe Sky had gone out of bounds or something like that. But, you know, how about you play until the whistle goes? No one sort of went after, like no one literally on either team went after the ball. Mark Mitchell eventually picked it up. He tossed it ahead um, and, and uh, Flip found uh, Tyrese in the corner for a three-pointer with, and Louisville was barely getting back on defense. But it, to me, that play sort of was indicative of the, again, I don't want to say lack of urgency because there were times that Duke had urgency, but there wasn't consistent urgency, so to speak. There wasn't consistent hard play. Uh, it's tough when you're up 20 plus points on a team that's that's terrible. I've said that like three times now. I don't even know, know what point I'm making, but that one play, I just sort of watched it and I was like, Come on, can, can someone go after this ball? Can someone actually care? about possessing the basketball on either team. It just felt like a ugly game in that regard. There's one final thing that I wanted to discuss, and it's something that I've kind of seen over the last few games. And it's more, it's not necessarily a, a bad, bad, but it's more of a challenge. And it's, it's about Jalen Blakes, Jalen Blakes. He's the only guy on the team. Uh, he had a three trillion tonight. Unfortunately, he's the only player that played that didn't score. But what's kind of interesting is over the last couple of weeks, We've talked about how great he is on defense and how great he is at being a pest in, you know, being the thorn in the side of the opponent and making it where they are forced into taking bad shots. He's not necessarily, you know, picking up steals or anything like that, but he's at least making them uh, making the, the opponent do bad things with the basketball. And the last couple of weeks, what I've noticed is that the Hornets nest type of defense that he has has become more uh, a little bit more erratic and chaotic. And it's not, again, this is not like a huge bad thing, but it feels like when he's on the floor, it feels like it, it, it gives you the impression that he's lost in the sauce. And so my challenge would be for Jalen Blakes to get back to the, the hornet's nest pest type of defense that he was doing, you know, throughout January and in, in, in early February, where he was just a pain in, in the side of everybody he came across. And I don't know if that's more of a mental thing about you know, how he gets how he prepares whatever I don't know what the what the exact answer for that is but that's the Jalen Blakes that we need 
I don't necessarily care about the three Churian. What I do care about is that when he's in the game, that he causes, he doesn't cause, he causes chaos for the other team, but he doesn't do so in a chaotic manner, if that makes sense. So that's what I'm looking for from him. Against Virginia, there's an opportunity for him to get some minutes and an opportunity for him to be a pest and be the guy that forces Virginia into taking bad shots because they're not going to be, it's not going to be that many, ladies and gentlemen. We're probably going to get, you know, 40, 50 shots, maybe uh, 40 shots. But at the end of the day, I need him to be the guy that when he comes in, the other team just kind of looks and just goes, damn, because they know that for the next three minutes or whatever, whoever he's lined up against is not getting a good shot. That's what I want from Jalen Blanks moving forward. You know, it's interesting. I think one of the big questions for Duke moving forward with Caleb Foster out is sort of where do those minutes go? I mean, I think to some extent those minutes go to Proctor, Roach, and McCain playing a little bit more even than they have been. But but there's there are going to be minutes available. Um, and do they end up going to another guard in Jalen Blakes? Or I think what we saw tonight was John Shire's preference was to try and give those minutes to TJ Power and especially to Sean Stewart and sort of rotate guys around a little bit. You know, it, maybe it allows you to, pl- to play Mark Mitchell at the three, you know, a little bit in, in that kind of regard. Um, you know, there, there are different options that you have with with guys who can you know shuffle from one position to another, um, but I, I think that's one of the interesting questions um, you know for for Duke going forward, especially for the game against Virginia. Donald, let's get to the play of the game. I got a couple nominees. I want to hear yours first. So my okay, so I have an almost play of the game, and then I have two nominees. The almost play of the game was Mitchell's running yam attempt uh, that missed. Uh, oh my! Because if, if oh, that had wow. gone in. It, I'm sorry, Spencer. That wouldn't that you you would have been replaced because uh, that one would have been. It was an almost almost great play. Uh, the play of the game. I think there was one that was like one uh, A, and that was Mitchell with the reverse jam. I thought that one was really cool. But it's got to be Spencer Hubbard's three man, like because it, it wasn't just like a normal run of the mill three where everyone's like, oh yeah, the the bench, the guy at the end of the bench got a three. No, this was a this was a Steph Curry three from the parking lot. Uh, and and he and he had it sh- shot it with such confidence. And at the at a game again, that's very much chaos. You want to end it on a positive note. You can't get more positive than Spencer Hubbard three. So interestingly enough, I have uh, look Spencer Hubbard's three was on my list for sure. Mm-hmm. But I had two other nominees for what I thought was the most important stretch of the game. This is the first couple minutes of the second half. There was a play, and this is not my play of the game. This is my almost play of the game. There's a play where uh, Kyle Filipowski was spinning inside the free throw line, a little bit further from the basket than he usually is. And, and he started to fall down. He almost lost control. And as he fell down, he tossed the ball to Jared McCain in the corner, and McCain just drained a three-pointer. And the thing I loved about it was, as they came back up the floor, Flip was howling, howling with laughter. He was like, I made that move too early. I was in no position to do that. I was just, you know, I'm not even sure he saw Jared McCain when he tossed him the ball, but he thought that was the funniest thing he'd ever seen in his life. But my real play of the game, only seconds later, there's a Louisville player who takes a really tough shot. He falls on his back and somehow grabs his own rebound while he's lying on his back. And he goes to pass it to his teammate. And Jeremy Roach is just like standing there like, you know, when you're lying on the floor, there's not a lot you can do. Roach is just like, yeah, I'm going to just... And Roach intercepted. It was like one of the easiest steals, one of the easiest interceptions you'll ever see. Uh, the team races up the the court, and seconds later, uh, Jared McCain is making a sweet pocket pass to Mark Mitchell for a nice layup, and Louisville got a timeout. The reason that was my play of the game was because that gave Duke an 18-point lead with about 18 minutes left, and I turned to the person I was watching the game with, and I said, this game is over, and mm-hmm. I think that we all agree. Uh, that was the moment. I was like, okay, you know, let's see what happens next. We need to watch it, but this game is over at this moment. Uh, it was a, a great example of Duke being in full control. And by the way, it started with some really nice defense. The The reason that Louisville player took that bad shot was that we were all, I think it was Mark Mitchell was like all over him on defense. So, all right, anything it's, else it's on, or are we ready to roll? No, I think it's great that we had several, you know, play of the games to consider. Uh, usually it's just like one or two, but the fact that we, we both picked two and, you know, I had an almost, uh, almost play like that's good. That me again, that means you had a good night. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right, look, folks, we're going to be along very soon, probably about 24 hours or so after you hear this to give you our preview of the Virginia game. Big, big game. You know, Duke, frankly, has a really, really interesting and and really difficult uh, final few games here in the in the ACC. We have Virginia coming to Cameron. 
Then we're at NC State, and then the Tar Heels visit us once more. Can't afford to drop any of these. You know, I still think we've got an eye on a potential two seed. Can't afford to drop any of these games if we're going to have that happen. So Donald and I will be along to preview the Virginia Cavaliers, a very interesting team, a team that seems to be reeling a good bit right now. And, you know, tonight with the win, we clinched the double bye in the yes. ACC tournament. So that part's done. But as you mentioned, this is a very tough stretch to end the season. Uh, you know, again, three games that are traditional, really, you know, really difficult for Duke. This is knuckle up time, ladies and gentlemen. Again, if you want to get to those high seeds, if you want to go for the one seed in the ACC tournament, the two seed in the NCAA tournament, you want to get put in Boston uh, for the regional in, in Brooklyn or something like that, you got to win these games. So let's go out and let's, Let's focus in. We start on Saturday. I know we have a Saturday Monday uh, double here coming up, but it starts with Saturday. So yeah, we'll be back to preview v Virginia. I'm looking forward to it. I love it. All right, that's going to do it for episode six zero one of the DBR podcast, the Duke Basketball Roundup. By the way, don't forget, you know, check out our link tree. We got a whole bunch of links there of different folks that we think are just fabulous, and uh, you know, and more are coming. More coming. I love the sound of that. Yeah. Putting pennies in my pocket every time, baby. <laughs> <laughs> just pennies. All right. Yeah, just pennies. For Donald, I'm Jason. Hey, do you hear him right now? They're playing our song. It's the Duke Band. Playing us out and taking us home. <laughs>